Welcome back to the Campaign Builder. I'm Adam. And I'm Dan. And we're showing you how we build a campaign to get characters from level 1 to level 20. We know that your table is different than ours, so feel free to use, adapt, and throw away whatever you need to in order to make things work for your campaign. We're expecting a well-rounded party, so we're designing encounters for the following five general archetypes. Warrior, Priest, Mage, Criminal, and Outdoorsman. We now have a level 3 party, and they're rushing to catch up with some escaped convicts. And yes, it's personal. So let's continue our overland chase and see where we end up. Let's get to building. Alright Dan, so... Chases are something that we have seen over and over and over again in movies. I mean, the car chase is a staple of the action genre, and yet it's something that is a little lacking in D&D, right? They have a mechanic for it, actually, and I'll, I'll cover that in a sec here. But this is a major feature in some other games. A Call of Cthulhu, I, chases are a, a massive part of that game. And yet Dungeons yeah. & Dragons doesn't really put any emphasis on them when you think that there very much would be. This just reinforces again in my head that D&D is a combat-focused um, uh, game, tabletop role-playing game. And so there are yeah. definitely opportunities to role-play, and they're starting to lean more into that these days now that we've, we're moving further and further away from 4th edition. But what differentiates a chase from random hunting and tracking in D&D. And I just want to be clear, we're talking about an overland chase, not a chase through through a marketplace. So um, I want to uh, I want to cover the, the marketplace chase in a moment here, but in your opinion, what differentiates a chase from just hunting and tracking when you're playing this game? There's the urgency, right? Like there there is a immediacy to a chase that the tracking and hunting doesn't do like tracking and hunting you're stopping you're bending over you're looking at bent twigs or marks in the mud whereas chasing you can almost see your quarry or at least see the immediate effect of your quarry passing by and you are you are running after them you are chasing them that's that's why it's so different than hunting or tracking I agree with you, but most of the time when I've seen some sort of chase in D&D, it is you run for a certain amount of time and then you stop and you do a survival check. Can you find their footprints? Yes? Okay. And then everybody runs for... Everybody roll a D10. Okay, that's how many minutes you run for. And now we'll sit down and we're going to do another survival check. Right? And it just becomes the most boring skill challenge of all time. Yeah, a lot of chases have been relegated to skill challenges, I find. Yeah, well, okay, so here's the actual mechanic for it, okay? It, you can find this in the Dungeon Master's Guide. They uh, they say right in it that uh, this can turn a potentially exciting chase from a dull, predictable affair. So they know that this can be mechanically dull right from the beginning. So the idea is that uh, you can use a dash action every round, and people will be tempted to do that. You roll initiative, and you're essentially chasing. You get actions and movements, and those actions can be used for attacks or spell casting. But of course, if your quarry, the person you're chasing, is going to dash, they're just going to get further away from you. And because everybody's moving in the same direction, there's no such thing as an opportunity attack. Hmm, okay. You can dash on your turn a number of times equal to three plus your constitution modifier. I'm sorry, pardon? So in a chase where you guys are just full-on sprinting after each other, you can run for your movement, so let's say 30 feet, and you can dash three more times. And if you have a constitution of plus two, you can dash twice more. So you can move six times your walking speed. Yikes. However, so can everyone else in initiative, right? Now, here's the catch. Every additional dash action that you take during the chase requires you to succeed on a DC 10 con check. Not save, check at the end of your turn. Or gain a single level of exhaustion. Ooh, okay. You drop out of the chase if your exhaustion reaches level 5, since your speed becomes 0. And this time, exhaustion can be recovered on a short rest. And all of the exhaustion goes away with a single short rest. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting, right? Yeah. Additionally, if neither side gives up the chase, um, any time that the quarry, the person you're chasing, gets to the end of their turn they can make a stealth check. If they beat the past perception of the people that um, are chasing them, they get away. However, if you can see them, they automatically fail that. And it does go into 
how to make things um, more difficult or easier for the person. So if they, you know, turn a corner in a crowded market, they might get advantage. If they, uh, if they go into an uncrowded or quiet area, they get disadvantage on the ability to hide, right? Like, so there's, there's stuff like that. It also says that the lead pursuer is a ranger, just is a ranger, or has proficiency in survival, <laughs> then, then the quarry has disadvantage to hide from them, right? You can do things like uh, cast fairy fire, right? Which would make it more difficult to hide. But then it has two D20 tables of complications, things that are going to get in the way of the chase for everyone involved, both the, the quarry and the people chasing them. Okay. So there are these D20, so there's two D20 tables, but it only has 10 options listed in each. And if you roll an 11 to 20, there's no complication at all. It then gives you an idea on what to do to design your own chase tables, splitting up, it really suggests that uh, you map the chase out ahead of time so you know what obstacles are going to show up. Uh, it, and then it talks about, my favorite thing is role reversal. What happens if you're chasing a thief and members of the Thieves Guild see this and then start chasing you at the same time? Or in typical yeah. Han Solo fashion, you chase the single stormtrooper, they turn the corner and, and there's 400 of them, <laughs> right? And so, like, and there are rules for it in there and it's neat and it's interesting, but that's not what we're talking about today. That's the little chase mechanic. I think it's it's very, very similar to our dynamic encounters because it's got its own unique rules. It's like a skill challenge in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like, there's some fun to be had here. The problem is nobody uses it, so well, we never talk about it. Well, it's, it's hard to do when you've got such a uh, tactical-based game that requires, like, a battle map and you see you see these guys who build these 3D uh, printed battle maps, right? With, like, their Dwarven Forge or whatever they're using. And then... <laughs> You're not going to do that for a chase because you don't have 400 feet of a straight line. So, I mean, I, I, I like these rules. I like I like what they uh, what they can inject. Um, but I would definitely encourage when when you have the short like uh, let's say a small ground race, right? Like like when you have a foot chase within the city, right? With within a city, or I mean, all of us kind of picture that like the Aladdin running away from the guards level chase, right? Like that that. Um, is kind of what we all have in mind. There's going to be some parkour going on. There's going to be some um, knocking baskets from merchants in the way of the pursuers. Um, this all stuff is going to be in there. Have fun with it. But I, I, I think I agree with you, Adam. These these rules are they're lackluster. Well, it, it, it's interesting because when you sit down and you look at it and you look at the complication tables and there's actually it. Uh, I did not do it justice. Uh, but I did it about 70% justice. There's more meat here. Okay. I can really see this being very effective for when you chase the kobold. You kill three of them, but the fourth one escapes and everyone starts chasing them through the woods. I can see this for kobolds and goblins and and the one knoll. This is where I see people having decoys and, and you getting chased into an ambush, right? Or you being um, suddenly forced into an area that you're not familiar with. You weren't expecting to do this. Now you have to do a survival check to find the road mm. again. Yeah, like, okay. There's some really interesting opportunities. I think you're right. It's a little lackluster in the urban setting, but in the wilderness setting where you're kind of open a little bit more, I, I love the idea of you running forward and stopping and going, wait a minute, why am I standing in webs? Oh, shit. <laughs> and there's three-phase spiders, right? Like, there's there there can be definite interesting ways of going about this but you've got to think outside the box you got to do your own due diligence and it's not the same thing as an overland chase which is what we're talking yeah. about right we're talking about when you chase someone for days so this is not how many times you dash per round this is a test of endurance so now that we've talked about what exactly a a chase is and how we differentiate the idea between a short term or a small map chase which you're right dan this is theater of the mind, isn't it? Yeah, you don't have a battle map for this. No, you might have a city map for this or an area map that you can track people through um, as long as you're being consistent with your measurements. But you're right. You don't have a battle map. I mean, if you were if you have planned a chase, like in this session, we are having a chase. You could have several like pre-made uh, encounters already drawn up. I would if, if you're running off like a vinyl map, I would hesitate taking a moment to draw it out because a lot of what makes a chase important is pacing. And that's not just in the game, but also with the administrative side of it as well. Like um, if, if you're in the middle of a high energy tense 
urgent chase and the dm goes okay one second i just got to draw this out and draws out an alley and goes well here's a little garbage bag and there's a little tree over in this corner and there's and, and like that ruins that sense of urgency at the table i would definitely have if if i have a preset encounter like say uh the chase is going to run through the market full stop i would definitely have a market drawn up on my little grid paper or or uh 3d battle thing already made and drop that on the board and be like you guys he is going to go from here to that end from this end to that end and here's the stuff in between and because you're already dealing with initiatives you're already in kind of a combat mode you could do something interesting in that situation that would require that tactical thought but for everything in between that isn't this prepped instance definitely 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 theater of the mind you want to maintain that sense of urgency exactly i'm i would want to drop a map on the table i don't want to draw a map live Mm -hmm. i think that maybe using something like roll 20 if you have enough prep time where you can really like draw out miles and miles and miles that's an interesting way of doing it right yeah but i i think that you're right for for the people for dwarven forge for for the random artists like myself who just want to draw out a map every week chases these chases are are very difficult so let's talk about the overland chases for a moment uh, we're, we're going to talk about uh, look it's obvious yes there are survival checks yes you're going to have acrobatics checks or athletics checks or stealth checks and and these are very straightforward you're going to run into evidence along the way and have to do perception checks like you wouldn't believe we know all that and there are skill challenges that are that are almost a foregone conclusion with yep. this, but we're gonna do an we're gonna do a session here that focuses on chasing someone from one city to another. So that's really what we're talking about because our our enemies, Lachlan's lot in our story, has escaped and they are running from the city. There are two or three major figureheads that we will know, like named NPCs, but they've got I don't know goons, thugs, yep. people with them, right? And so they're heading off towards the big capital city they want to get lost in the urban sprawl and you guys know that if, that if they get there before you do they're gone yeah so what do you do well you got to catch them and there are a number of different things like you can run into random encounters in the wilderness that might slow you down a little bit or whatever like the dms can can come up with a, a normal way but what are some hallmarks of a chase things that you can throw in there or or ways to think about this in a unique way to really keep the idea of a chase alive as opposed to just hunting and tracking. All right. I want to roll initiative on this. Sure. Okay. So I, I want to talk about some stereotypical hallmarks of chases and how you would, uh, how would you might want to implement them as well. So let's roll initiative. Ooh, I got a nine. I got a 12. All right. You first. One of the big things, obviously I was going to say urgency and you already covered it, but um, one of the big things uh, that I want to talk about was uh, people being chased often know that they're being chased. They know they're being hunted and they're moving as quickly as possible. That's where the idea of the urgency comes from. It's not like you tracking a deer through the woods. Yes, you may spook the deer, but then it's going to think that it got away from you and stop again. People getting chased don't stop. They keep going. Their paranoia is through the roof. And they're going to do everything in their power to get away from you. So they know that they're being chased. And you know, generally speaking, who you're chasing. You may not have, you know, their social security number, right? You may not know the intimate details. You may not even know what their, what their name or class is, but you know that that half orc over there or the three cultists took whatever. I've got to race them to the docks, right? Like whatever it is, you know who you're your quarry is who you are chasing you have a general idea also of who's chasing you let's keep this you know two ways here yeah sometimes you're the ones getting chased as well if you've got a rogue or a bard in the party that's going to be far more frequent than if uh you're just a party full of paladins (laughs) well even then i mean big bad evil guys put hits out on parties of paladins right i i guess that's true i guess that's true Um, The next thing that I would say is uh, key to a good chase is the distraction, the misdirection. Like you said, the people who are getting chased know they're getting chased. Um, And when you are dealing with a large overland chase like this one, it's not necessarily that you can see them, although that very much will happen. But is uh, they know that if they delay, they're going to get followed. So... Um, a smart, a wise, an intelligent uh, chasee 
will often try to drop some misdirection down, um, either the the old branching path that goes into nowhere or the run through the stream to lose the footprint. The run through the stream, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, that's going to happen in every single chase. Um, I mean, depending on length. Right. So the misdirection is huge. You got to have misdirection. And what that does is that adds a certain amount of intrigue to the to the chase. But uh, as a DM, I'd be very careful. Urgency is prime. So if the distraction really slows down to a halt your chase, you've created a problem. Make the make the misdirections, make the distractions a little I wouldn't say easy, but uh, definitely obvious. guide them. In, yeah, make them a little bit more obvious, right? Like if it's a branching path, your quarry has not had the time to run a mile, turn around, follow their step back, their steps back a mile, and then go a different direction, just to add you time to you guys, because all that will do is minus from his time. This has to be fortuitous to the quarry um, for him to be able to do this misdirection for those kind of things. So um, keep that in mind when you're throwing these things at your party or when you're coming up with them as the people who are running away. Whatever you're using as a misdirection, it's got to keep that urgency up. Okay, uh, my next thing is at the very end of the chase, this is a standard hallmark of any chase, is the moment of catching someone. Right. The idea that you have got to catch them. And it's funny because there's no rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide about catching someone. Huh. It's just about chasing them. So what happens, it says, oh, attacks of opportunity don't don't apply here. So you can run up even with them. But if you don't have your action left, then they're just going to run past you again. Right. So I feel like everyone's saving their action to the very end of their turn to be able to jump on someone. And then it's what? A grapple check? Is that what it is? Your moment of aha. But when it, when we come to overland chases, this is when you find that you've been chasing them for three weeks, uh, and you see. I think I think of uh, the gunslinger mm. as well. If for those of you that have read the first Dark Tower book, th that entire book is an overland chase. The gunslinger chases the man in black through the desert. That's it. That's the whole premise. And the man in black is ahead of him, and you don't know anything about him. You just know that he's the man in black, and he's got crazy magic powers. And the gunslinger is coming to hunt him down. That's it. You don't have really any other details until the very end of the book. But at the very end of the book, there is that aha moment where you do catch up. And when you do catch up in a chase, I, I, I think of the idea of there being a bunch of people sitting around a campfire going, wow, we've still got two days lead on them. Yeah. Meanwhile, the outdoorsman and the criminal are sneaking around in the position, readying their weapons, right? Catching them unaware. Most chases end with some sort of ambush. Even if you know that the person chasing you is is there, you're not expecting them to grab you in this moment and wrestle you to the ground. So whether it's a grapple or jumping them while they're asleep or whatever it is, there's an ambush factor, a feeling of, aha, Eureka, I got it. Take this, you little bitch. Right? <laughs> whatever it is, <laughs> when you when you finally do catch up. That's a big part of the chase. There's a rewarding feeling to it. Okay, the final thing I have for uh, a hallmark of a chase is the collateral damage. Usually you have something going on around you that is either pushed on by the quarry or, or initiated by the quarry that is designed to be able to slow you down. And often that's like knocking over a basket or a fruit stand like... We've all seen that one action movie where the that fruit stand crosses the uh, street very slowly and, and the quarry gets past it, but whoever's chasing drives through it and, and fruit and veggies erupt into the sky. We've all seen that kind of moment. Um, these are the kind of things you have to have. It could also be large scale collateral damage, like driving into a building or, or running in through a window and like having to flip tables and, and, and just destroy everything in your path to get to your quarry. These are things that have to happen in a uh, chase in order to have a little bit more depth to it. Right. If it's just a straight out, you know, race and you're flinging spells back and forth and, and you're trying to figure out a way to, you know, finally catch your uh, quarry even on an overland uh, race if you don't have collateral damage if you don't have things around you impeding or getting in the way in some way shape or form then it feels like you're just running on a racetrack 
And if you want to add that little bit of depth, that little bit of flavor, that little bit of style to your chase, you're going to have collateral damage. And this could come in the form of inanimate uh, objects in people uh, crossing the road or, or uh, people crossing the path and messing things up. And I would say this comes in three uh, three places. Either the DM is putting it in front of the quarry to, sw- to slow the quarry down. It could happen from the quarry putting things behind them and uh, putting objects behind them. Or it could even happen from the chasers throwing these things up in advance, destroying some sort of building to impede the path of the quarry. Uh, collateral damage is vital. Yeah, you've got spells. This is D&D. You can change the weather or mold earth, right? You can... Oh, they're running through the river. Let's let's control water for a second here. Yep. There there are I like the idea of you just using create food and water. You create a keg of ale directly in front of them and bang, they they bail over it. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, but wouldn't it be fun if? Yep. But like you could use you think about your your thaumaturgy for yelling at them or creating thunder or spooking their horses, right? Like there are um there are definitely some interesting things that you can do with the magic spells, the utility spells, minor illusions as well could be a big thing i love the idea of the quarry getting to like a a cliff a ravine right and they can see the other side of it and they cast fly on themselves and then they sit there and they make a minor image of a bridge and then they stand there and wait yeah that is a great way for you to have your monk or whoever's in front your martial artist or whoever's in front to just bail right off the edge of the of the cliff well, this 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 adds a little bit more depth the second you start bringing in vehicles as well as well. And you look at like the the soldier background or the folk hero background, you get proficiency with vehicles, and that is never used. Here is where you could use your vehicle proficiencies and actually put those to use at the table, rather than it just being a a, a sub note on your character sheet that you just you spend more time writing it down than ever using it in your campaign. Yeah, and honestly, when you have your martial artist or your criminal who can move these ridiculous lengths and and they are just outpacing everybody else and your your uh even your warrior that your uh outdoorsman maybe who's got these really high constitution modifiers that are they're like they're willing to run and chase. Keep in mind we have riding horses. A riding horse's base movement speed is 60 feet. They get to dash four times because they've got a plus one con. Like, it's designed. These these animals, these creatures, these vehicles are designed in the short term to catch up. So you can imagine that in the overland, in the long term, they're going to make a hell of a difference. I just want to be clear as well. Uh, when it comes to a chase, the other big difference between a chase and tracking is that with a chase, you know what the stakes and the consequences are. The stakes and the consequences are usually they will get away. It can be they will get to the thing and activate it. They will go tell someone a thing. But the people chasing have to understand the stakes and consequences. If they don't understand them in a big open world campaign like Dungeons and Dragons, your players may just get distracted and say, you know, what? it's not worth the chase. I'm not going out into the wilderness for far for four days by myself to head to that city I've never been to before to chase that guy down. He's just a thug who gives a shit. But if that thug has a wanted poster with your face on it and he's heading to the greatest bounty hunter in the land, it might be worth tracking him down. So understanding your consequences is key. Uh, as a DM, you have uh, the opportunity to give your players a little bit of a peek behind the screen because if you don't do your due diligence uh, to ensure that they at least understand the depth of the hole they're digging by choosing to not uh, chase after this foe, then um, when it comes for those repercussions to fall down, they're going to feel even more upset and even more cheated by you, the DM, for not doing your due diligence. So uh, definitely set up the encounter and and let your players have a bit of a glance behind the screen and, and let them know the depth of this. Like the, the repercussions here, you're right, Adam, are very important. All right, so we've talked now about what makes a good chase, but now how do we include dynamic encounters as part of it? How do we include the idea that there's more than just skill checks and and we caught up to them and there was a brief combat yeah. or uh we one of them was lagging behind and we stopped and kidnapped them and now it's 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 just a small role play and obviously exploration after exploration after exploration these overland chases seem boring how can we spice them up obviously we each came prepped with three things that's what we do at the end of every episode well we we should definitely be uh reestablishing the fact that our whole thing here is a chase by definition is going to be pretty on the rails. 
So in, in order to make it seem like there is a little bit more impact, there is a little bit less of a straight railroad going on, it's it's good to inject in a few prepared big set piece encounters to any chase rather than it just being a skill challenge till completion, right? I, I just wanted to get that out before we rolled the dice. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So that that's why we're doing this. So initiative. Let's go. Okay. Ooh, a 19. Uh, seven. My big uh, first encounter here is a combat to combat encounter in which uh, Lachlan's Lot or whatever uh, enemy you are chasing has escaped um, in a cart and the party has to follow. They're loaned a cart by previous NPC that they've had good interactions with and then they chase through the desert. Halfway through, because of the noise, a basilisk emerges. A basilisk is native to the desert. Um, so a basilisk is going to pop out and takes out the party's horses, giving uh, Lachlan's Lot a chance to get away while the party deals with the beast. I like that because this is kind of that level of um, accidentally running into that, that fruit cart, right? In an urban setting. But this is an overland chase now where you have disturbed something in the natural surroundings which you now have to deal with remember combat in D D usually lasts less than a minute yeah so the idea that in an overland campaign this is going to cripple you it, it's it's not but it's going to be an interesting set piece for your players to play in they're not going to be expecting it they may want to slow down they may want to scout ahead more this could have other impact beyond just the encounter itself and it's a great way to kind of set the tone for your back out in the wilderness yeah, I would definitely set this up as maybe the first encounter I do to like start off the chase. So this is when your party is maybe neck and neck, like they are seeing their opponent get away. So they're hopping on this uh, cart with urgency, no time to prepare. They're chasing after, they're exchanging blows with the cart, with the their quarry in front of them with spells and arrows and various projectile weapons. And all this because of all the noise, the carts rumbling across the desert, everything else, um, the sound of fireballs and spells going off. This is what's going to draw forth the basilisk, which is going to give your quarry a chance to extend that space between them, making this a large overland fight. All right. So my first one is uh, is going to be an exploration to role playing because there's going to be a lot of exploration in this. We know that. We didn't really spend a whole lot of time focusing on exploration to exploration because that's a no-brainer. So let's think outside the box. I want to go exploration to role-playing. We're dealing with the desert, and so I want there to be shifting sands. One of the first things that they're going to do, the, the quarry, the people getting chased, Lachlan's lot, the first thing they're going to do is get off of the road, right? Because they know that they, they're going to be chased down on the road. Now... Roads exist for a reason. Roads make traveling easier. So going off the road actually slows you down, but it slow down others as well. So what benefit do you have over other people out in the wilderness? And one of the things that they understand is that there are shifting sands and moving dunes, but there are a series of dark holes in the ground in this area. And one of them is a tunnel that pops up way further down where they're where, uh, like nearby the road in uh, like miles and miles and miles away. So that it's actually a shortcut that the party won't know about. But mm -hmm. the party can see the the footprints disappearing or, or the cart tracks disappearing into the sands as they start going. And now all of a sudden, they've got all these dark holes in front of them. There's a little bit of exploration that they've got to do here as they explore the area. And then they discover that darklings live there. Now, a darkling is a fey creature on the unseely, the evil side of, of the fey. But they have their own little societies. They've got elders and they've got soldiers and whatnot. And they're still fey. They are still totally willing to deal with you, mm -hmm. but the danger is up. And there will be dozens of them because you're in their home. And they like the dark and they like the tunnels. And these are their tunnels and their caves. And you don't get to come in here unless you're willing to offer us something. At which point we will guide you through appropriately. And so you've gone from this exploration where suddenly you're ambushed so that you can haggle. And in my head, in this scenario, is very much like Jawas jumping up and saying, yeah, we'll give you your droids back, but for a price. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's it's the same kind of feel here. For my next encounter, I kind of I kind of follow the same path that you're going with on that one, Adam. And and um, I would I would do an exploration to combat encounter where your party falls victim to some of these quick sands, these shifting sands, these shifting dunes, 
and they find themselves stuck and have to remove themselves from the quicksand and uh, shifting dunes. But they are stuck long enough where carrion birds have noticed and are starting to circle overhead and maybe are even starting to attack uh, in order for their next meal stuck in the sands. Uh, This is an exploration to combat encounter that has your party trying to get uh, their horse or their cart plus themselves out of some quicksand while dealing with this threat of these carrion birds who are not going to be easily, you know, scared away because they're hungry And you ain't moving very far. I like that. I like that quite a bit. Um, I'm just trying to think what else could be there besides carrion birds. That's, um, I like the carrion birds, but what, what could possibly exist in the desert? Oh, you could have, you could have on kegs. You could have, uh, tools. You can have, um, pretty much any and every insect based, uh, animal or monstrosity or or creature I would have here. Even just swarms of insects or or scorpions or but whatever it is, it's drawn to you, right? Yeah. Now there there are vultures in uh, the monster manual, but the vultures are CR zero, so. Oh, I yeah. I mean, beef them up is my point. Yeah, yeah, beef them up. I mean, you could also do the thing where it's like go with a little bit more of a horror theme and. Now you're stuck to the ground. You can't move. And there are yuan Ti surrounding you. Or a known cannibalistic tribe all around you. Actually, sorry. I, I just looked. There's also giant vultures, which are CR1. Yeah. And that can be a little bit scarier, even for a tier 2 party, if there are a dozen of these things circling overhead, dropping down one at a time. And that that's the cool thing I like about the carry-on birds, is they don't all land at once. They come at you in waves. Right? They do little flybys. It makes it a very unique encounter, and I really like this. So, my next one is going to be a uh, party politics encounter. Ooh. Because we haven't had this in a while with the party having to make a real solid infighting decision. The party captures a mid-level member of Lachlan's lot, for whatever reason, got left behind. He surrenders immediately, and then tries to sabotage their progress in minor ways at every opportunity. So the party will take him on at first, I would assume, because they want to bring them to justice. This is not a kill or be killed scenario. This is where we're dragging you back to jail. And then he does things like he stalls. He stops walking. Not enough to actually impose a threat. So they shouldn't be tempted to kill him. But of course, your warrior will be. (laughs) Your criminal might want to. But your priest and your mage might say, hey, we need to hold on to this guy. And there will actually be some fighting about what do we do with him. And he's going to keep piping up over and over again. I surrendered. You can't kill a guy in in manacles. I am completely at your mercy. What do you do when you start to play on the heartstrings, but sabotage the chase like that? That's going to be, that could end the chase right there, right? It really could. Yeah, it really could. Your your party could decide to, to keep this guy alive and let him keep doing his thing. And then, and then Lachlan's lot's going to get away. But I really like the idea of there being this, this sudden moral question in the middle of the party. In the middle of an overland chase. What do we do? We don't have time to stand here and argue. The only, the only thing I would say is when you get into these ba- massive moral quandaries, you, you run the risk of removing that sense of urgency as your party bickers back and forth. So I would use this NPC as a uh, driving factor as well, have an, have an option for them to be the driving factor to maintain this urgency. If the party's arguing for too long, they get away or they uh, start sabotaging and causes the, and, and the party could see it. And now the party's got to react to that as well. It could be far more subtle than that. They can just simply glance at where the sun is uh, in relation to the horizon and start to grin. They know that they've slowed the party down. This is exactly what exactly, they want. Exactly. Right. So, so as a DM, I, I love the idea of throwing in this moral quandary in the middle of the race, but or the middle of the chase. But remember, it's it, you got to be aware to maintain that sense of urgency to keep the spirit of the chase alive. All right, for my last encounter, this is the distraction. This is the um, this is the quarry having the opportunity to maybe add some. Uh, false tracks or or something along those lines, but I would add a little bit more weight to it and have maybe black smoke reaching from this fork in the path of the uh, quarry you're chasing. Um, and if the party 
investigates that black smoke, they're going to find a burned out um, in our campaign, Black Ink Union Caravan. In your campaign, the caravan to a friendly faction or a friendly NPC. You really want to draw on the heartstrings here as um, you find this thing has been recently looted, burned down, and all of the members of the caravan, guards, uh, merchants, everyone has been like gutted and spread out across the desert sands. Um, and because I definitely want this to be a bit of an alchem alchemical thing as well. Um, as your party is investigating into this exploration to combat encounter, their dead friends, their dead allies, these dead people associated with a faction that they are friendly with, rise up and attack the party as these alchemical zombies. This is another one of those things that is going to slow your party down, giving your quarry a little bit more time to get a bit more of a head start. I like this too because you don't necessarily have to go alchemical. If you remember way back in, I think it was session three where we were talking about the escort mission uh we had established that there was cursed land out in the desert and the water mages had accidentally f fought a caravan yeah and killed the people there and ambushed them and then those those people rose from the dead and you had to fight some zombies so we can start to give the idea of this overarching theme of the area look i love the alchemical thing as a cool thing that Lachlan's Lot is doing, I think that's badass. But if you want to establish the world a little bit more as well, and you don't even need to have this be a dynamic encounter, it could be one of your regular encounters of just, you know that the ground is rotten here. The sands are cursed in some places. If the sands shimmer at noon or at midnight, then you know that there there's going to be evil, undead, whatever rising up. And so you've just inspired me, Dan, to think more about the um, the surrounding area and what uh, what flavor, what what we can introduce thematically to come back to over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Because this desert is going to be one of the big things that we're dealing with for at least the first half of this campaign. Okay, so for my last one, I wanted to do a combat to combat. And um, I know that you started off with a combat to combat, Dan, but I really like this as um, a bit of a red herring considering my previous one about the saboteur in their midst, their their hostage. Yep. Lachlan's lot purposefully leaves a straggler behind now. This is not someone who got abandoned. This is someone who is sitting there um, outside of the jingling city because that's where we're heading. We haven't gotten to the capital yet. We're halfway there. We're at the jingling city. And he tries to slow them down with a powerful magic item. Maybe multiples. This guy is going to be a CR2 thug, but he's packing a punch like a CR5, right? He's got some third level spells that he's uh, slinging at the party and the party's going to be coming at him. And in the middle of the fight, a group of strange men appear with scimitars. They don't announce themselves. They just pop up out of nowhere and you don't know what side they're on. And suddenly they're attacking everyone. They should be more powerful than they look. And they should only be doing subdual damage, so non-lethal damage. These are the town guard, and the party gets arrested. So in the middle of this big set-piece battle, you think, we've got to the end of the session, this is it, we're going to fight the guy, and he's going to be the big Lachlan's Lot mage, and why, why we've never run into this guy before, and it turns out that he goes down relatively easily, but then you're ambushed by the town guard, and you end on the cliffhanger, you are arrested. Ooh. The feel I have for these uh, towns, these town guard, is the that faction of warriors that they meet up with in the mummy. Uh, you know, honestly, that was exactly where I was coming from with this as well. That was exactly what I had pictured in my head. The the ancient warriors that were protecting people that were they're wearing all black and they've got the tattoo and they've yeah we're we're talking the same thing yeah. right. That is exactly where I was coming from on this. <laughs> so uh, that... and like they just rise from the sands and like you're in the middle of this fight. And then all of a sudden, you're just surrounded by this wall of, like, black cloaked figures. And the only thing you could really see, the only thing that catches the light is the blade of their scimitars, which all of them gleam. And there's just this ominous weight that is put on your party as now you've got to realize you you fighting this little thug. And, just, and like you said, he's part of this Lachlan's Lock group. He's, he's throwing around fifth level... Um, or sorry, third level spells, maybe even because we kind of teased that the alchemy side of things might be a little bit more up Lachlan's lot side. So maybe some like improved 
alchemist fires or some shit are getting thrown around that either way the desert landscape is being changed because of this guy and now you've got to deal with all i I love all of this i love it all it's great (laughs) the other thing that i'm that i'm doing with this is we had just told them they're folk heroes in the previous session we would just gone on and on and on about how everybody loves you here and now we are establishing that you're not in your home base anymore yeah you had a big win at home but now this is an away game and you do not have the advantage now i'm going to be completely and totally upfront on the podcast but i wouldn't tell my players this we're starting off the next session with them getting released from jail after they've already successfully um told their side of the story We don't even need to role play it because Lachlan's Lot has a negative reputation in the Jingling City. The moment that they look at the body of the person that you killed, they they will understand what's going on. But they got to bring you in for questioning anyway. And so your introduction to the Jingling City is going to be with bags over your heads and interrogation. And it's all going to be run um, exposition style. And then you're released into the middle of this crazy city. And you can hear the chimes going. And and so, like, this is this is what I want to start the next session on, where they don't know what to expect. They go all week going, oh, shit, now what? Maybe they're planning prison escapes. Maybe they're sitting there going, well, which what can we do to prove our innocence, right? Who are we going to throw under the bus? <laughs> and they're all stressing about it just to find out, because they would, right? The characters would stress about this as getting dragged into the city. Yep. So make the players stress about it. So that's where, uh, this is one of the handful of times that I like ending on a cliffhanger. And I think it would be a lot of fun. And that that's that's why I want to end with my dynamic encounter. Pull the rug out from under your players and sit on it for a week. No, I, I really like how it subverts expectations with your party as well. Like they've co- they've come from this big win. They're they're riding high. They've just had this big fight and now they're all prisoners again and it pulls the rug out from under and they don't win. And I, I think that's that's the the greatest part about this is they Lachlan's lot left a guy behind. But the majority of them still made it into the city. And now you have a different kind of search, but you have this massive thing in front of you. It's a great way to end a session and a great way to start the next session as well. Okay, Dan, do we have any uh, quick additions that we want to circle back to really quickly before we wrap this up? I mean, what I would definitely, I've been harping on it all episode maintaining that sense of urgency when you're when you're planning a a session that is a chase even if it's overland is paramount to most any other aspect of the game so when you're planning out your encounters which you could share with us at info at itsmimic.com you really have to focus on maintaining this drive forward right and in whatever way it is so i would just reinforce with all the dms out there listening and all of the players listening really realize that a chase is about the chase it's about the journey and maintaining that sense of urgency that sense of drive forward regardless of what the ending is like yeah urgency is key the thing about overland chases and we keep saying overland but there's also the timing and the pacing you're talking about as well everyone should know how many days travel it is to the next thing the reason that we like the desert for this so much is because you're not going off script you're not going to get halfway there and go left. There's nothing to go left to, right? And so the idea is that you know exactly where they're heading. They've got to go to the Jingling City first, and then beyond that is the capital. They're going to head to the capital because that's where their main headquarters are, or that's where they can disappear into the crowd, whatever it is. So we have clear expectations. We know how many days it takes. They get to choose whether or not to push on with the level of exhaustion if they decide not to sleep that night. You know, like there's a lot of stuff that we've uh, outlined in this. And it's going to be a lot of fun for pacing. I like overland chases as opposed to in-the-moment chases, which can be exciting and dynamic themselves. But I like the overland chases because it gives you opportunity to have a break, to have things be calm. There's a sense of urgency over over the entire session. An underlying level of stress and anxiety while having them try to maintain constant battle tactics or role playing that they've done. And it's a normal session but with just an extra little bit of stress. So, that chase was damned exhausting. Now it's time to sit and catch our breath. This is going to let us recuperate and refill our water skins with our cranial fluids. Tune in next week when we discuss what it's like to be an outsider in a new, unfamiliar town. Thanks for listening to this episode of the It's a Mimic Campaign Builder series. You can find other episodes at www.itsamimic.com and on iTunes, Spotify, and most podcast catchers. We're also available on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and more, and would love to hear your thoughts 
on how you would use this episode in your own homebrew campaigns. I'm Dan. And I'm Adam. And we'll be back with more prep work next week. I got so many little toys within reach. Oh, I'm not even touching that. I am. <laughs> okay, bye.